Of all the directors who emerged from the French New Wave, Jacques Rivette is the most elusive and enigmatic, and some have argued the most consistently innovative. He's never been a media figure or a counterculture hero like Jean-Luc Godard. He's never had mainstream hits like François Truffaut or Claude Chabrol. He's never even been part of that well-loved mainstream art house canon like Eric Romer. Rivette has had his significant cult successes, notably his 1974 film Céline and Julie Go Boating, but he's never been a director you could easily pin down or categorise. He's someone who's interested in different types of cinema and in setting new challenges with each film, new challenges to himself, to his cast and crew, and to his audience. All these traits have tended to set Rivette far outside the mainstream, even outside the arthouse mainstream, if there is any such thing. A reclusive figure, Rivette is also an obsessive cinema-goer. He said, I see a lot of movies and I don't stay away from anything. He has very diverse tastes, the classical canon, but he's also put up spirited defences even of such much reviled films as Paul Verhoeven's Showgirls. Born in Rouen in 1928, Rivette started a literary degree in his hometown but never completed it. Instead, he came to Paris in 1949 and absolutely immersed himself in cinema and never looked back. His passion for cinema, he claimed, was sparked by reading Jean Cocteau's notes on the shooting of his film La Belle et la Bête, a book which Rivette read so many times that he said he ended up knowing it by heart. In Paris, he became one of that group of Cinematheque regulars, along with Godard, Chabrol, Truffaut and Romé, who also became identified with the journal Cahier du Cinéma, a journal that Rivette edited in the early 60s. There, he became a celebrated critic, writing on the American canon, Hitchcock, Lang, Ray, etc., espousing the rigorous virtues of Fritz Lang, writing a famous essay on Rossellini as well. He also worked as assistant director to Jacques Becker and to the French filmmaker who, more than anyone else, became the great patron and model of the Nouvelle Vague, Jean Renoir. After making four shorts, one of which, Le Coup du Berger, is still viewable today, Rivette was the first Nouvelle Vague director to start work on a feature, Paris nous appartient, in 1957, but he made the film over two years piecemeal, with borrowed stock, with encouragement from Chabrol and others, and by the time the film was released in 1960, the limelight had already been stolen by Godard's Abou de Souffle and Truffaut's Les 400 Coups. That rather left Rivette in the shade, and in a way he's continued to be in the shade since then partly by choice and through his insistence on taking on difficult, uncategorizable projects. Yet he has remarkable staying power, like his surviving Nouvelle Vague contemporaries, Godard, Chabrol and Romer, and like their contemporaries Alain René and Agnès Varda, he's still active today, and at this very moment, summer 2006, he's working on his latest feature. He's nowhere near as prolific as Godard and Chabrol, but he still makes films regularly, and each one couldn't be by anyone but him. The films are of remarkable variety. He's tried literary adaptations, versions of Wuthering Heights and Diderot's The Nun, and stark historical dramas, a two-part version of the life of Joan of Arc. He's experimented with assorted genres, thriller, ghost story, even a musical. He's made other, more radically experimental films that defy categorization entirely. Duel is a stylized melodrama with mythical and comic book elements about two goddesses who come to Earth in search of a mythical diamond. Norwa is part pirate adventure, part Jacobean drama. He's also made one of cinema's most extraordinary contemplations of art and the relationship between the painter and the model, La Belle Noiseuse. Perhaps Rivette's most specific interest is in theatre its difference from similarity to film, the different demands that theatre and cinema make on its participants and on the audience. If some of his films are unusually long, three, four hours, in the case of his out one, nearly 13 hours long, it's because Rivette wants to use duration in a particular way. He uses duration to make film going a more active experience, to make us aware of being in the cinema, of seeing it through. Rivette is fascinated with cinema less as finished product than as process. And in this way, many of his films show a fascination with the open-endedness of theatrical production and performance. 
In his first feature, Paris nous appartient, much of the plot hinges on one of the characters attempts to stage a production of Shakespeare's Pericles, and somehow we feel that the entire fate of the world hinges on its success or failure. The production turns out to be doomed, yet some of the actors soldier on at the end. Rivette's open endings send us out of the cinema with no sense of easy resolution, but they make us aware that cinema and theatre, and indeed real life itself, are processes that go on that can't easily be wrapped up with fake closure. The plays in Rivette's films are never stylized, detached, complete products, and the actors are real people caught up in the messy dynamics of real life. But by the same token, real life itself becomes a sprawling, free-form drama without clearly identifiable beginning or end. Rivette's Paris becomes a vast stage on which multiple mysterious dramas are forever played out, without most of its population being quite aware of them. As witness the bemused reactions of the many passers-by who happen to be near Rivette's camera when some of his more enigmatic scenes are taking place. In Rivette's films, all the world is indeed the stage, as well as the cinema screen. But where in Godard sometimes you get the impression that for him there isn't anything in the world except cinema, Rivette really is interested in cinema and in the real world as well. He's an obsessive cinema goer, but at the same time you get the impression that making films is for him a chance to get out of the cinema and into the real world, into the open air and working with people. Celine and Julie Go Boating is without a doubt Jacques Rivette's greatest hit. It's the film of his that's been most widely seen and the film that's had the greatest influence. American director Susan Seidelman was inspired to make a kind of US remake, Desperately Seeking Susan, a vehicle for Madonna. And the critic David Thompson has said it's the most innovative film since Citizen Kane. His 1974 Fantasia may be one of the most complex, suggestive film essays ever made on the mysterious pleasures of cinema, but it's also a game a freewheeling adventure that Rivette shared with his cast and crew over one hot summer in Paris, the ultimate What We Did on Our Holidays film. Like many of Rivette's films, Celine and Julie is implicitly about cinema, specifically about the magic of cinema. It's a female buddy movie or a female romance about two women who team up one sleepy Paris summer to solve a ghostly mystery, or alternatively, to go on a time travel adventure. The film begins with a wonderfully atmospheric sequence in a Paris square where librarian Julie, Dominique Labourier, is tracing runes in the sand. She's trying out a book of magic spells. By chance, or perhaps conjured up by Julie, along wanders Céline, Juliette Berthaud, otherwise known as stage magician La Mandragore, a rather amateur female version of comic strip hero Mandrake the Magician. Céline starts scattering a trail of scarves and other knick-knacks behind her, and Julie, intrigued by this absent-minded striptease, which is possibly a veiled sexual come-on, pursues her across Paris. The two women become firm friends, possibly lovers, although we're not sure. Above all, they become childlike conspirators, sharing an adventure that they seem to make up as they go along. The adventure centres on a strange haunted house in the suburbs. The two women take turns to visit the house, but we don't yet learn what goes on inside. After each visit, Céline, or Julie, emerges with her memory erased and a boiled sweet in her mouth. The sweet becomes their magic passport back to the house, or a ticket to the movie that seems to be screening on a perpetual loop inside the house, which Céline and Julie watch over and over again, enraptured and fascinated. The events in the house are a sort of film within the film, Perhaps the film entitled Phantom Ladies Over Paris, which is the subtitle of Céline and Julie. First seen in fragments, then gradually through repetition, coming together in coherent form, the episode in the house is a sort of pastiche 1940s melodrama involving two elegant women, played by Bulle Augier and Marie-France Pizier, Olivier, the man they're competing for, played by Barbet Schroeder, the film's producer and a director in his own right, and a young girl called Madeleine, shades of Proust's Madeleine, who seems to be in mortal danger. The scenes in the house are replayed over and over while Celine and Julie take turns to play the other part in the melodrama, the sinister nurse Miss Angèle Terre, whose name implies variously mystery, mystère, and frozenness, stasis, in French, 
mise en gel, or frozen. Finally, Celine and Julie, with the aid of their sweet and some magical talismans, a homemade witch's brew and some dinosaur eye rings, get together to sabotage the events in the house, rewriting the sombre melodrama as knockabout farce, rescuing Madeleine and unfreezing a suspended past. It's like last year in Marion Bad reworked as a girl's own adventure. But Celine and Julie is much more than this. Over three and a quarter hours, the film takes in magic acts, musicals, a nocturnal raid on a library on roller skates, and masses of quick fire, often obscure French wordplay. It's an unruly, meandering film that seems to be made up as it went along, but in fact it wasn't. It's very structured. The film came about when Rivette and Juliette Berthaud were working on another project that fell through. They decided to go on and make something new straight away, and they came up with the idea of a film about two women, a comedy. They got together with Berthaud's old friend Dominique Labourier, and together they conceived this strange conception. Berthaud and Labourier worked together, worked out their own narrative, and Rivette helped them sculpt it into an overall film, his role Berto said was akin to something like surgery. Then another writer, Eduardo de Gregorio, came up with the story of the house, derived from two Henry James stories, a very early short story called The Romance of Certain Old Clothes, and a later novel, The Other House. The Romance of Certain Old Clothes is about two women competing for the same man, and from the other house comes the element of a young girl in danger. Rivette, interestingly, had never read either story, and possibly never has to this day. Berthaud and Labourier, by the way, came up with the names Céline and Julie, and it was only after de Gregorio got involved that they discovered that Céline and Julie were the names of Henry James's favourite actresses. Anyway, all this explains how the film has a rather complex script credit, taking in Rivette, de Gregorio, Berthaud, Labourier, Augier and Pizier. This is a film made by its cast as much as by its director, a very democratic piece in the spirit of the early 70s experimental theatre. This might suggest something very chaotic or predominantly improvised, but that's far from the case. In fact, there's only one scene of improvisation in the whole film, where Celine drives her theatrical friends up the wall with her tale of meeting a rich American woman. The rest is very much written, even if it was written off the cuff. During shooting, Berto actually moved in with Labourier. Every morning they tell each other their dreams of the night before, and they'd write intensely before they went in front of the camera. Celine and Julie is very much a hymn to the joys of improvisation, of making up the story as you go along, and of being caught up in its pleasures. Aller en bateau, literally to go boating, figuratively means to get caught up in the story that you're being told. Rivette had previously made a film along similar lines, The 13-Hour Out One, a sprawling film in eight episodes in which a huge cast was invited to make up its own narrative as it went along. Celine and Julie is a more concentrated version of the experiment in a much more playful mood. It's virtually a children's film about characters who, from the very start, with its obvious allusion to Alice in Wonderland and getting pulled down the rabbit hole of narrative, seem to revert to a childlike state. You can see Celine and Julie as children who instantly become best friends and create their own escapist dream universe. <laughs> Celine and Julie doesn't explicitly refer to cinema, and yet it becomes an extended analogy for the pleasures of filmmaking and film watching, and for narrative more generally. When they visit the old house, Celine and Julie disappear into the dark, and when they emerge, they emerge as we do, dazzled, when we step out of a cinema into broad daylight. Of course, going to the cinema in daytime is a quintessentially French activity. The events in the old house are like a film on a loop, except that the fragments of scenes have been jumbled. And as they watch it over and over again, Celine and Julie edit it into shape, project themselves into the drama, finally rewrite it. Typically for Rivette, though, the episode in the house is not just cinema, but theatre. The knocks you hear when Celine and Julie enter the drama for the last time of the traditional knocks sounded in French theatres before the curtains go up. Cinema becomes as alive, as concrete an experience as lived theatre. The whole world, too, becomes a stage. Paris, in these oddly dead summer months, becomes a stage on which Celine and Julie can act out their vaudeville. There's definitely an element of street theatre to the film. 
When Céline meets Julie's childhood sweetheart Guilou on a bandstand, watch the faces of the passers-by. They're not movie extras, but people who really just happen to witness this piece of flamboyant absurdity. They don't quite know what they're watching. Look at the people staring, baffled, as Dominique Laborier chases the funicular in Montmartre at the start of the film. They're wondering who this mad woman is who's belting up the steps for dear life. Rivette dispenses with the illusion that films create when they steal off their sets from the real world. In Celine and Julie, we're getting the film, but we're also getting a documentary about its own making. The film is a dream that goes on and on, a fiction that seems arbitrary, circular, and could easily have been another film entirely. It ends in circular fashion, suggesting another version of the film that could have been called Julie and Celine Go Boating. And that's why this dream of a film haunts its viewers, works on our imagination so much, why it's excited such affection. It's also inspired some irritation, and watching it today, it's hard not to feel a degree of impatience with the hippie-ish ditziness of the Berto Laborier duo. There's often a fluffy narcissism to Berthaud's performance especially that can be grating, especially in her more childlike moods, and the performance here has dated less well than the hipster bandit femme role she played in Out One. But undoubtedly we have to make some allowances for the film as a period piece. The behaviour is as much of its time as Berthaud's stack heels and bandanas. The 70s wardrobe too, especially La Bourrier's, actually looks more archaic than the vintage frocks worn by the ghosts. And although the central duo play it excessively girly at times, you can still see how powerful the film is as a feminist statement. In fact, most of Rivette's films feature female protagonists, either singly or in pairs. Celine and Julie take control of the narrative for their own pleasure, defying and mocking the men they encounter. The sleazy showbiz sharks at Celine's nightclub, the pompous lover Gilou, the Byronic ghost Olivier. Irritating though Berthaud and Laborier can sometimes be, there's undeniably a unique vibrancy to their screen presence. You can really sense the pleasure they take in performing or simply in goofing around together in front of the camera. <laughs> One of Rivette's heroes was Jean Renoir. He worked as Renoir's assistant and learned from him that one of cinema's great pleasures was watching actors perform, simply letting their characters and personalities unfurl in front of the camera. And that was something that you didn't need to mess around with. There are no special effects in Celine and Julie. No spectacle, no how did they do that. The magic is simply on a DIY level, and it's magic partly because we're told it is. But there is a sense of something unprecedented, something enchanted, being pulled out of a hat, pulled out of thin air before our eyes. Celine and Julie is the product of a few people with a small budget, the desire to tell a story, and a whole city just waiting to be used as the stage for the best shaggy dog story in cinema. Or perhaps that should be Shaggy Cat's story. There are cats everywhere in the film, haunting the story at every turn, and according to Rivette, he didn't have to go out and find them. The cats were just there. Believe that if you like. The very last image of the film is a cat staring right at the camera. I like to think that perhaps the cat dreamed the whole picture. <laughs>